I will be in the first chapter of the Gospel according to John. John chapter 1. <clears throat> I'll ask you a question, is bigger really better? Is bigger really better? We live in a very small community here at Evergreen. Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania in a town about the size of, I would say the size of Esmer, a little larger than Evergreen, but it was a small town also. Been in many small town churches since I accepted Christ. In fact, the church that I accepted Christ in near Fort Polk was a very small rural church. True, it was a little larger than this. Uh, they could get up into the 50s. And I have been in, oh, I think I passed one church that had about 150 on regular attendance. Other than that, the churches that I have served and worshipped in have all been small rural churches. And I ask the question, is bigger really better? John chapter 1 verse 45 and following. Now here's what has happened. John the baptizer was in the Jordan River calling the Jewish people to come to him to repent of their sins to be baptized, to begin a new time of life. This was unheard of in Judaism. They would baptize Gentiles, they would baptize non-Jews. <clears throat> but this was the first time that they had been called upon themselves to recommit, to repent, to be baptized, and to start again. One day, as John was preaching, he looked out in the crowd, and there, sure enough, was Jesus of Nazareth. God, through the Holy Spirit, revealed to John that this was the Lamb of God. And he said, look in there. There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now in that crowd was a man by the name of Andrew. There was another man who was his friend. We believe it to be John, the writer of this Gospel of John. John and Andrew were in that crowd. They were followers of John the Baptist. They wanted to start over. They wanted a new beginning. And when John points Jesus out as the Messiah, as the Lamb of God that would be sacrificed for the sins of the world, Andrew and John, we think John, doesn't name him, but Andrew and this other disciple begin to follow Jesus. And they get to know Jesus. And then they traverse through the land up into Galilee, close to the Sea of Galilee. There is a city there that is called Bethsaida. Bethsaida is a little seaport town, a, a lake town really, a fishing village. And in that town was a man named Peter, Andrew's brother. Andrew goes to Peter and he tells him that we have found the Messiah. We have found the one that the Old Testament is pointing to, the Savior. And Peter also begins to follow with his brother Andrew and John. So now we have three. John, Andrew, and Peter. Jesus then, in Bethsaida, goes to a man by the name of Philip. Somehow Jesus must have known him before this, because he then invites Philip to follow him, and indeed Philip does. Now when Jesus invites you to follow him, one of the first things that happens within you is such a happiness that you just can't keep it in, you've got to share it, you've got to tell it. And just as Andrew had told Peter about Jesus, Philip now goes to his friend by the name of Nathaniel and begins to tell him, we have found the Messiah. John chapter 1, verse 45 and following. Uh, 
The next day, verse 43 and following, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, two words, same two words he says to you through the Holy Spirit, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, hmm, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and he said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to Jesus, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, that is teacher, master, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. The first human being that really recognized the divinity of Jesus was the man. Now John the Baptist recognized in Jesus a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Andrew and Peter and Philip saw in Jesus a very wonderful person to follow. But it is Nathaniel, and we don't hear anything more about Nathaniel. He's not mentioned anywhere until the very last chapter uh, at the end of John where he goes fishing with Peter and the other disciples. That's Other than that, we don't have any mention of him at all. But he's the first one to recognize that Jesus is God's Son. He is divine. And it was given to him by the Spirit of God to know that. But when he first hears of Jesus, he says, Ah, oh, Nazareth? That's a hip term. They're just country bumpkins up there. They're riffraff. They're nobodies. What can come out of Nazareth? He believed the Messiah would come out of some great place. Perhaps be born in the palace in Jerusalem. Somehow come out of the priesthood of the, of the temple. But Jesus comes from a little small town. Great things come from small towns. I don't know how you feel about it. But I'm going to tell you, little old Evergreen has had some great people come out of this town. All I have to do is think back. All I have to do is think back to some of the ones that I have known. And then I hear some of you talk about your own relatives and some of the people that you mentioned that have gone on and really made something of their lives and have made significant kind of impact on this world in the part that they live in. Bigger is not always better. God uses the little people. God uses the basically unknown people. Nobody's from nowhere. And that's who God uses. My goodness. Abraham, in the book of Genesis, he grew up in a town called Ur. You are her down just 136 miles south of Baghdad. It was a it was a heathen town. It was a town that worshipped the moon god. Abraham didn't know anything about God as far as we know. And all of a sudden, God speaks to his heart and says, get up and go into a country where you don't even know where you're going. Just have faith in me, believe in me, follow me. And he makes of him a nation that has blessed all the nations of the world through this nobody 
from nowhere. Moses, he's a fugitive from justice. He's murdered a man in Egypt, and he's running for his life, and he's spending 40 years sitting around campfires that are burning sheep dung. He's a shepherd out in the desert. And God speaks to him out of a burning bush and says, go and deliver my people. Moses was a nobody. He says, how are we going to do it? He says, you got a stick. you got a stick in your hand. Call it rod. Take that stick and lead my people forth. David, you guessed it, right? Another shepherd. A shepherd out in the woods, out in the hills, out in the desert lands, tending his sheep. And this nobody from nowhere becomes the great king of Israel that unites all of the 12 tribes into a great nation. Mary and Joseph. We've just been looking at them in the weeks gone by. Nobody's from nowhere. Okay, he may have been a good carpenter. We don't even know if he was a good carpenter. We don't know anything about Mary. Here she is, a teenage girl, betrothed to a man. And God's grace descends upon her and chooses her to be the mother of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. God uses the little people he uses the people in out-of-the-way places. God will use the people of this little community. God will use the people of this little church. You don't have to be bigger to be better. All you have to do is give yourself to God. What are some of the wonderful things that come out of this little church right here? There's a knowledge of the Bible Sometimes in the little churches. I've never forgotten out at Simpson, that little tiny country church near Fort Polk. I knew nothing about the Bible. I never really read it hardly at all. Had no tutoring in it. And yet I would sit around on Sunday evenings with a group of old men. It was called a brotherhood. And they would sit around with the Bible. That's all they had was the Bible. And one pair of glasses. They'd read, pass the glasses on. They'd read, pass the glasses on. That same little pair of glasses went all around the room. I didn't need them then. I was young. But I learned God's word from those old men in a little tiny country church. And as I hungered for it, and as I learned about it, I found that God had great, great teachers in that little church. I really ought to refrain David from saying it, but I can't help but to say it. What a teacher we have. And for those of you, and now it's coming, folks, yes, indeed, for those of you that do not come to that 10 o'clock hour and hear the teaching, I'm sorry, folks, but you are missing something. And God uses people in the little places to give God's word. Are you learning God's word, Michelle? Absolutely. Are you really growing in God's word? Very much. June, you've been with God's word a lot longer than her. Are you learning God's word? Every day. I'm telling you, you learn it together. When those ladies gather together, and I have the wisdom to get out of the house, when those ladies gather together, for the bi-weekly Bible study that Jude leads. And most of them, are, half of them at least, are not Baptist. And they're drinking it in. They're bringing Bibles to it. God is using teaching in a little tiny church. And it's not in our house alone. Our good neighbor down the road, Ms. Thompson, she goes to a different church, a Baptist church, but a different one. She visited it once. She has a group of boys and girls that come to her house every week, every Wednesday, and she teaches them God's Word. I remember as a child myself, 
There was a teacher, I don't even know her name. I only know two things about her. She was very large and obese, and she played an accordion. And she would gather some of us after school that had permission of our parents to go, and she would teach Bible in the fire hall, in an upstairs room. And what little I did learn, I learned from her in a little small town out of the way, a woman whom I don't even know her name to this day. She was a nobody from nowhere, but she taught God's Word. You've got people in this church that know God's Word and can share it and bless your heart so much if you just participate in that and appreciate the fact that there is sound biblical teaching in this place. And we learn from one another, not just from this teacher. Oh, the discussion in the class. Every once in a while, I learn something new from Sam. Every once in a while, I learn something new from Jim. As we share together, talk together, and nobody has to be afraid of saying something and being criticized. You can be wrong if you want. That's okay. You're not going to criticize you. But it's so wonderful to have in this little, small, out-of-the-way church people who share God's Word in a genuine, sympathetic, loving manner in which we can learn and respect one another. And we don't come with closed minds, closed eyes, or closed ears but we come wanting to learn new truth that we've never experienced before. And that is how God uses a little place and little people to bring forth the great news. What can you have in this little church? The experience of worship. Some people may not be comfortable with our way of worship. That's okay. There are some people that want it very quiet. And still, Ralph Waldo Emerson once said he had more worship experience in the quiet time before the service than he did in any of the songs of the preaching afterwards. There are other people that want a lot of excitement. There are other people that want a lot of activity and be able to express themselves. There's room for everybody in God's kingdom. And it doesn't matter if it's a quiet church or a loud church. It doesn't matter if it's a humble, silent church or if it is an exuberant, bubbling kind of church. We all have our ways to express it. And here is a place where you can be yourself. Here is a place where you can honor God with your worship in any way that you feel comfortable doing and you will not get criticized. You will not be put down. You will not be put into a mold. We will not tell you how to do it. We just want you to be sincere and loving and respectful of other people. And when you come here, you experience the presence of God and a worship. Bigger does not have to be better. Our music, all these hymns of faith. I learned all my, I started to say Baptist doctrine. I learned all my biblical doctrine out of a hymn book, the old Brahman hymn book to be true. But as they say those songs, it spoke to me. The Apostle Paul even tells us in one place in the New Testament to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and praise. And we teach each other through these wonderful hymns of faith. Oh, that is an experience of worship in this place. But most of all, Aside from the biblical teaching that you can have in a small place, aside from the experience of corporate worship that you can have in the little church, all the caring charity of love. I do not know of a man, a woman, or a child in the Evergreen area that would have a need that this church would not stretch forth their hand try to help them. I am one person. I remember well when I had my operation.
inauguration just a few years back. Living in Pineville. And in walks Debo and Pickle. And brought to June and myself a monetary gift that you had gathered up. And even beyond that, I'm looking into the faces of some other people who went above and beyond that and sent us help when we needed so much. This is a church that reaches out. This is a church that really cares. When mom and dad's house burned down the shell, <clears throat> who were among the first ones that called and came? Who were the ones that wanted to give? When Brother Holson fell and injured himself, what did this church do? They immediately voted to send some help to a man who could not earn a living. And it's not just monetary things. It's not just money. It's not just gifts like that. It's the gift of your personality, the gift of your prayers, the gift of your very being, your love that reaches out to other people. Oh, that is what it is all about because this is a church that believes in 1 John 3.16. Now, we all know John 3.16, don't we? How about 1 John 3.16? By this we know love, that he, meaning Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone, oh, underscore that in red, if anyone, Baptist, Catholic, non-church, Muslim, Jew, black, white, if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet he closes his heart against him? How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. And in the little church like this one, indeed in this one, there is love that is shown and shared with other people. Thus we still pray for those boys of yours way up in South Dakota. Thus we still care for those of you that are hurting. We still pray for Camille's eyes that they'll be completely healed. We still pray for those that are in Sue and Nettie's family that are still hurting. We still pray and care. And we would go. God uses people in little places. Nobody's from nowhere. And he makes somebody out of them that will make a difference in other people's lives. I say to you, be thankful to God for your little church. Don't worry that it's little. I wish it was bigger. My goodness, look at these empty ones. They don't know what they're missing. They don't know what they're missing. But you do. You know what you would be missing if you were not here. If you were not a part of this family of God. Nathaniel said, what good could come out of Nazareth? What good can come out of Evergreen? Oh, so much good. Because Jesus makes the difference in our lives.